Hello. Today I'll briefly talk about one of my favorite post-colonial novels from the Caribbean, exactly from Trinidad and Tobago, The Dragon Can't Dance by Earl Lovelace. And the novel was first published in 1979. Now, Earl Lovelace is one of the two most prominent authors from Trinidad and Tobago, the other one being, of course, famously V.S. Snipal, and they both kind of also straddle the two great constituencies or the great divide of Trinidad and Tobago, and that is the Afro-Trinidadian tradition and the Indo-Trinidadian tradition. Lovelace by far is one of my probably the most uh, favorite authors because of what he does in most of his work, but especially in this novel. Uh, so I've taught this novel many a times. I've published about it and I'll post my link to my article in the description. And every time I've taught it, my students have really appreciated not just the form, but also the content and what the novel broaches as, as its major themes. Uh, now, just to explain briefly the setting of the novel. So the novel is set in this specific urban slum, this urban neighborhood called Calvary Hill, which is a poor African Trinidadian neighborhood. And it has certain major characters. Of course, there is uh, Aldrich the dragon, who is our main character. Then there is Mr. Cleotilda, who is kind of the queen figure of the neighborhood. Uh, we have Philo, the Calypsonian, who grows up there, but then becomes successful. And we have Fisheye, who is the local tough guy. And then there is only one Indo-Trinidadian couple there, Dolly and Pariag, who are our only sort of outsider characters. So in terms of setting, it is set in a poor area and it's an urban slum within which the people who live there uh, inhabit a certain logic of their existence. And I had dealt with it using Pierre Bourdieu's concept of the field. Now, most of these people are poor, but they've also kind of created a performative identity which is based in renunciation of riches, right? There is no recognition of wealth in the story. So people take pride in being poor, but also being self-reliant and being a whole tightly knit community. Now, Aldrich, our main character, uh, is the artist in the story. Now, he spends about the whole year preparing with his hands one costume, okay, his carnival costume, which is that of the dragon. And then for three days of the carnival, he leads his community's contingent in the carnival, along with Miss Cleotilda, who is naturally the queen. Now, Aldrich the dragon, it's significant for him as an artist because the carnival is a huge annual tradition. And every community that participates in it takes pride in their costumes and how they represent themselves and carnival in the traditional sense is an upside down setting in which those who have the least kind of, you know, become the kings for at least three days. At least that's what its historical lineage from Europe. Aldrich is also the most complex character because he changes over the course of the novel. He changes because of his interactions with Pariag and others, because of his interactions with Miss Cleotilda and Guy, who is Miss Cleotilda's enforcer, but also because he gets imprisoned in a botched uh, revolutionary attempt uh, in which they all get arrested. But that's what sends him to this mode of reflection where he starts thinking about his own existence and realizes that despite the fact that they all espouse this non-capitalistic mode of living, even within the Calvary Hill, the power is distributed according to who has more wealth, right? who has more resources. 
And it seems that towards the end of the novel, Ulrich is no longer probably going to participate in the carnival and all the traditions associated with it. And maybe that's what teaches us something about the title, why the dragon can no longer dance or can't dance. Now, there's a lot in the novel, but there is another important aspect of uh, some form of identity formation that is very pertinent to poor communities, to uh, marginalized communities, and that's the question of double bind. And you might have noticed it in your own community. You see it here in the United States. In so many cases, when your cultural and social identity is built in resistance, it also gets connected to poverty because mostly people who are marginalized and on the margins of a larger culture are also uh, through no fault of their own impoverished. And then that becomes sort of an important marker of their identity. And then if someone succeeds from that community, from a poor community, it automatically is a move into the mainstream order. Right. So anyone who succeeds from a poor community and makes it in the world created by the dominant groups then has to face this double bind of their own identity, which is connected to poverty, right, and to community. And then negotiating this dominant culture and in the process of doing so, of course, when you negotiate with it, you have to give up certain aspects of your own identity. So if you're successful, you come from a poor community and make it, then you have to go back to your own community and also try to convince them that even though you have become rich or even though you have succeeded, you're still the same person. Right? People from dominant communities don't have to worry about that. And that's the double bind that Philo faces. Right? He becomes, he's a Calypsonian. And he gets discovered by a radio station and then he popularizes his music. But in the process of doing that, he also commercializes it, right? And he becomes successful. So when he comes back to his own community, the burden of representing himself back to the community as still being authentic, as be, still being a part of it is his struggle. You know, how do you go back after having succeeded to your own community and convince them that you've not compromised your principle, you have not sold out. Now, this is the double bind that a lot of communities of color face and individuals who succeed, they face this double bind. And I think this Philo's character represents a wonderful understanding of that concept. Then there is the tension between the community and the only two Indian characters, Fire. Pariyag and Dolly, who have moved in there from the rural part of Trinidad. Now, a lot of people read it as an ethnic conflict or as a, a sort of ethno-racism, but I read it in terms of Pariyag not really understanding the logic of the community itself, and you can read my article about it. My idea was that the reason the community is resistant to Pariyag is because his ways of proving to the community that he's one of them are totally um, economical. They rely on a certain kind of economism, right? He succeeds financially. He buys a shiny bicycle, right? All of these are signs of upward mobility, but they are blatant. They announce themselves as such. And he's living within a community where that part of financial success of anyone is veiled. It's assumed that it's not there. There's a misreading involved. Now, Miss Cleotilda is rich, but she doesn't go around saying that she's rich. She's not rich, but she's well off. So I think it's that conflict, the community seeing itself as poor and developing its own logic of understanding and Pariyag entering it and disrupting it and not understanding that communication is what causes the friction. And that teaches us something more about the logic of symbolic capital itself. How does it work within a poor community? How does a community live within a capitalistic society but pronounces or uses 
performatively this non-capitalistic way of dealing with things, even though everything that they possess, eat, acquire, you know, is acquired through capital. So that's one of the major themes in the novel. So overall, it's a novel set in an urban slum with characters who are mostly poor. The territory is policed by Fish Eye and his tough guys, right? The main character is Aldrich, who performs the role of the dragon. And towards the end of the novel, is reflecting upon not doing it ever again because he reali realizes the futility of non-involvement, of being apolitical, and what it does to him and to other people that, that if you just buy into art and keep performing, then people who have power over you can use that to just manipulate you just like Miss Cleotilda and Guy within the novel. Overall, um, it would give you, the novel would also give you a better understanding of the Africo-Trinidadian tradition, especially of the poor working class or even the urban sub-proletariat in Trinidad and Tobago. And also, if you explore further beyond the novel, you will learn more about Trinidad and Tobago. And one aspect of it that's important uh, which you can misread in the novel is that the Indian population, the Indo-Trinidadians are not a minority. Actually, the split, the Indo-Trinidadians and the um, you know a African Trinidadians is almost 50-50. There are two political parties ethnically aligned. And there is a historical reason for friction between the two communities because when slavery was abolished in Trinidad and Tobago, the East Indian indentured workers were brought in to take the jobs that would have become the jobs for the free slaves. So all of this history beyond the novel will be very important and crucial for you to read, to really enjoy and learn from this novel. Uh, I will post the links to my article there. My brilliant friend and former student Hella has another wonderful article on the novel. If I can find uh, uh, that article, I'll post the link to that as well. Uh, this brief introduction, Hope, encourages you to read and teach The Dragon Can't Dance. If you have any questions, please post them in the comment section. And as always, I'm really thankful that you joined me here and uh, I will try to keep producing these videos and these audio lectures as well. So if uh, you feel like it, please do subscribe to this channel. And that is all today until I see you next time.